police work specifically, investigation, is all about problem solving. I am the lead for the Homicide Unit for Northamptonshire. You get an immense sense of satisfaction when you get the right result from a job. During 2018, there had been a spate of killings across Northamptonshire. In the October, DCI White was working on the major incident team. He received a call about an event in the Upton area of Northampton. It was around about quarter to ten at night. I was looking, getting into bed, and uh, the phone rang. The detective sergeant who was on the night crime car at that time was on the other end of the line. She basically said that we've had a shooting and we've got a person deceased in the middle of the road, shot in the chest. Can you come back to duty? By the time I got there, there was quite a number of people there, including um, the, the lad's family. The victim was a 22-year-old man who was father to a newborn baby. In the early stages of an investigation, there's sort of a finite amount of time where uh, memories are fresh, alibis can be corroborated, where uh, forensic evidence is fresh, and you're more likely to solve a murder, for instance, in the first six hours. So we really hit the first few hours after a murder really hard. There was no obvious motive, very little to go on, in what looked like a planned killing by very serious criminals. We've got a victim on the ground. Do we have any witnesses? Do we know who the offenders are? Has a gun been left in situ? The shop near where the offence took place had CCTV. That was a real break for the investigation, the first major break that we had. The CCTV had captured the entire event, including the moment the victim's car arrived and he got out to make a phone call. Now that's really important to us. Who is he phoning at the point prior to him being murdered? He goes off out of the shot of the CCTV, then reappears a couple of minutes later at the point where the second car arrives. Our victim gets into the rear of the offender's vehicle. It appears it knows him. It appears there's no issue. And he sits there for around about two minutes, and then he gets out, and both the driver and the passenger get out as well. And very quickly an altercation takes place. The victim was being pursued by the driver of the second car. But a passenger from the golf he had arrived in also jumped out. Some flashes from some gunshots. Bullets were discharged. A young father lay dead. Two gunmen were wanted. Right now, there were very few leads. This investigation would require a range of highly specialist skills. Greg Taylor is a senior investigator at the National Ballistics Intelligence Service. I'm a firearms and ballistics examiner for the National Ballistics Intelligence Service and I was the primary scientist for NABIS on the operation. We examined firearms and ballistic material recovered from crime scenes. Mark D. Giovanni at Advanced Laser Imaging was also brought on board to help make sense of the murder scene. I'm a crime scene reconstruction expert. In all police investigations, there are questions that police officers have. It might be around locations of people, lines of sight, uh, trajectories, there are a whole host of information that's related to the environment itself. Historically, the way they could uh, try and understand these is to go to the scene and try and recreate it physically. However, there are huge amounts of inaccuracies in doing work that way. This elite team were codenamed Operation Pageant. The victim obviously has a mobile phone on him and also had some identification. So that mobile phone was key for us. Who was the victim? Finding immediately prior to the offenders turning up. The second challenge was to see what could be determined from the small amount of forensic evidence found in the scene. 
We had the bullet casings retrieved in a forensically sound manner and sent off to Nabis. To start with, we received three casings from the crime scene. These were just left scattered on the street scene. But because you've got a fatal victim, there was a post-mortem, and we needed to recover the projectile from the body. The first job that we do as a forensic scientist is to look at those casings and try and understand things like type of gun that have been used. For an event where you've got three casings, you might have one gun, you might have three guns. When a firearm discharges and it leaves ballistic material, the markings that are on there are unique to the gun, like a fingerprint. With the cartridge casings that have been recovered, we were able to infer that they were likely from a Glock pistol. When the projectile came in to us, we were able to infer that that was from a 38 caliber revolver. There were two guns that had been used. Meanwhile, the police detectives began analyzing their second lead, the victim's mobile phone. We have a look at the phone and we can establish that he's calling a number ending 2895 immediately prior to the shooting. We need to find out who that is. Uh, a swift inquiry with the phone company outlined that it's pay-as-you-go, so we don't get anywhere in relation to who that person is. But the pay-as-you-go burner phone made a call immediately after the murder that the police could track. This becomes a significant line of inquiry for us. Why is he receiving phone calls from 2895? And what is his relationship to the 2895 number? We track that phone. The police now had the identity of someone they believed was connected to the killers and possibly a getaway driver. Their third and final lead was the second vehicle that had arrived on the scene. Defenders were driving a Ford Focus. We know that for the shape of the vehicle, although we couldn't make out the registration number of that vehicle. We receive a phone call from the force control room outlining the fact that there was a car on fire in some wooded area, and I believe it's a Ford Focus. Luckily for us, it's only partially burnt out. That fire could have destroyed valuable forensics, linking the Ford Focus to the murder. So DCI White decided to also explore a new theory. You'd have to assume that if they were going to burn out a Ford Focus in a rural area like that, they'd have some means of getting away. The suggestion was that 2895 number called the third suspect and his vehicle were part of that sort of escape mechanism, so we really needed to find him. Within hours, their hunch paid off. Early the next morning, a road traffic collision was phoned in from Junction 13 at Milton Keynes and the vehicle that was involved in that was the third suspect's vehicle. When he returned home, he was greeted with a welcome party from Northamptonshire Police and we had him arrested. Yeah, yeah. Police were confident this was the getaway driver, but he wasn't telling them anything. Retrieved his vehicle from Junction 13. And after examination of the vehicle, we found that the vehicle contained a telematics box which is actually a gold mine of information for us. And that created a trail of movement on that vehicle. The telematics identified that that vehicle had been on the same farmer's track as the Focus, where the Focus was burnt out. So we could put that vehicle there. From there, that vehicle then traveled down to London. So we know that the third suspect stopped in London, in an area of London called Edmonton, turned around and came straight back within a couple of minutes. All the evidence suggested that the driver transported the killers to Edmonton. While units hunted the two shooters hiding in London, the investigation battled to piece together the evidence from the scene. One of the issues we had was that the CCTV from the scene really didn't identify who did what at what time, and this could have been a, an issue at court for us. And I wanted to see if we could do something around creating 3D imagery. DCI White turned to Mark Di Giovanni and his cutting edge laser technology. We capture the scene in its entirety digitally. We can take that back to the office. It allows us to carry up much more accurate 
uh, reconstructions and it allows us to produce a much better final product that they can put into court. The 3D technology we use is laser scanning. What this technology basically does is it fires a laser into a scene and then it measures the returning signal. It ends up picking up everything that device can see accurately into a 3D measurement. So what we end up with is an animation running through the, combining the CCTV um, and, and all of the information we've got together. So, so here we start to represent people coming out of the vehicle as cylinders. And as this person moves towards the uh, group of other people, we see this little white flash over here. Um, and that's actually our, our first gun flash. And we can freeze it at each of those flash points and we can start to show where those people were. What we can show is who wasn't holding the gun. And it's quite an interesting principle is actually in the CCTV, apart from in a specific case such as um, Shot 4, which we're going to see now, where the flash actually pretty much emanates from one person's hand and we can, we can prove that. In all the other cases, what we're actually doing is we're proving who didn't fire the shot. We receive information back from Greg Taylor in Nabis that he's been able to identify DNA off one of the casings. We can identify that the prime offender has at the very least handled that bullet. Fourteen days after the murder, the police now had two suspects. But the two gunmen were believed to be hiding somewhere in London until they received a critical tip-off. We got some information through that suggested that our offenders were holed out in a flat in Northampton. I was a bit sceptical about this, to be honest. Um, it, it made absolutely no sense that two people who were wanted for murder in Northampton, gone to London, potentially could have gone anywhere in England and Wales, had returned to Northampton the scene of their crime. It made no sense whatsoever. However, we follow our poor information. We're keeping surveillance on the address, to see who's coming and going, and we see a woman leave, and she goes up to a chip shop, she buys three bags of chips. We know that we've got to do a warrant within that flat dead quick because they're expecting her to come back with their evening meal. Anyone in flat three, show yourself. The warrant is executed. Okay, you, step out of the flat, keep your hands in the air, put your hands against the wall, and step down those stairs, slowly, slowly. Do not make any sudden movements, do you understand? Okay, step down the stair. Step down. Step down. Okay, listen to my colleague. Put your hands in the centre of your back. No sudden movements, okay? They bring out the people that are within the flat one by one. I was not expecting their names to be read out over the, over the police radio, but when they said that it was our suspects, I was ecstatic, it was great. We need to interview them, but they don't say anything on interview. They're obviously not going to say, yeah, it's me, it's a fair cop. No, nobody ever does in, in a murder interview, but we had enough evidence to be able to charge them with murder uh, and they're remanded in custody awaiting trial at Birmingham Crown Court. With the suspects in custody, police believe they knew the motive behind the murder. The first suspect was dealing drugs at the time, mainly cannabis, and he was shortchanged between, depending on who, who, you, who you speak to, 10 to 40 pounds uh, by the victim. Somehow this got out of hand. Eight months after the fatal shooting in Northampton, all three men were found guilty at Birmingham Crown Court. The first gunman, Jerome Smichael, was sentenced to life imprisonment. The second gunman, Kiongo Shaleko, was also sentenced to life imprisonment. Both killers must serve a minimum term of 32 years. The getaway driver, Lewis Carmody, was sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Distraction burglars are criminals who trick their way into your home, 
by pretending to be a tradesman or an emergency worker or an official. It's a rare crime that forms less than 5% of all burglaries, but the trauma can have a catastrophic effect on the victims. And the criminal's favoured victims are the vulnerable or the elderly. I just love the opportunity to help people. I don't think many other jobs give you that chance to do that. I would look at any burglaries that come in and try and identify the offender. Kent Police established the Chief Constable's Crime Squad in 2019 to focus on burglaries. The Crime Squad is made up of two halves, so you've got the investigation side. We will deal with all the offences that are coming into custody. The disruption side have a lot of involvement in arresting the criminals. Summer 2020, and the police were called after a burglary at the home of a retired elderly couple. On Saturday the 20th of June 2020, um, an elderly male and female were out in their garden. The elderly male came back inside the property about midday and noticed that his wallet and lots of cash was missing. He telephoned the police and reported it. It was in a very rural location, so there was a lack of CCTV, there was a lack of witnesses. The victim himself hadn't seen anybody go in and out of the property. The victims were an elderly retired couple and the criminal hadn't finished with them yet. On the 6th of August 2020, the elderly male contacted the police and explained that a male had knocked on his door um, saying that he was a police officer called PC Davis from Canterbury Police Station. He referred to the earlier incident that the victim had reported and stated that he needed to come and identify some seized items at Canterbury Police Station the following day. However, when the elderly male had explained this to his wife, she became suspicious um, and advised him to contact the police. As well as the loss of money and items, the invasion of a home by burglars is often highly disturbing for the victims. The fact this burglar impersonated a police officer suggested he would stop at nothing to get what he wanted. The crime squad dedicated two crack officers to the case. PC Adele Tyder and PC Mike Eels. Mike is a very determined individual. He won't leave any stone unturned. I'm currently a disruption PC on the Chief Constable's Crime Squad. It's a job that's varied, it's a different job every day. Obviously, it's nice to make a difference to people. Operation Canyon was up and running. We as police officers are here to protect members of the public. He took advantage of that and tried to manipulate the victim. To be honest, I was completely disgusted with that. If he's going around posing as one of us, of course people are going to trust him. And the effect that that has, they'll now doubt everybody. He basically just knew that there were elderly people living alone and he could take whatever he wanted. On the same day, police were contacted by another gentleman living in the village of Wingham, close to the scene of the first crimes. Police received a further report, approximately five minutes drive away from the first victim. He had returned home and had seen a male in his garden. The windows of his property were open and believed that the male had been inside. He confronted the male and the male then ran off. When the victim went back inside, he realised that his mobile phone was missing. This person is desperate. They will steal whatever they can. Two houses had been targeted, but his crime spree continued to escalate, and soon police received calls from a third victim, a 91-year-old suffering from dementia. The offender was described as aged about 40, with mousy brown hair, wearing a grey or green top and dark trousers. We now had three reported burglaries in a very small radius, all targeting vulnerable elderly victims. It was too much of a coincidence. It lit a fire within me, to be honest, to catch this guy. Operation Canyon urgently needed to identify the criminal. 
you have to walk the scene, look for CCTV cameras, ring doorbells, dash cams. We needed as much CCTV footage so that we could try piecing it together. There was private CCTV from neighbours, however it wasn't clear enough to identify any suspect at all. We noticed that there was a small white van involved in a number of the offences. However, you couldn't make out any registration mark. We didn't have anything further to go on. We just knew that the male committing these offences was in a white van. and The village shop was a couple of hundred yards away from one of the victim's properties. We thought we would just check it on the off chance that he'd gone into the shop or driven past the shop. The officer's hunch proved to be a potential game changer. CCTV showed a white van pulling up at half past three, which was half an hour before the reported offence. They returned again the same day at approximately quarter past six, just a couple of hours later. The footage also suggested the burglar was not working alone. A second male then got out of the vehicle and entered the village shop first, and from that piece of footage we were able to get a good facial recognition of male two and then male one entered the store afterwards and we managed to get a very clear image of the suspect. The first offender even took his sunglasses off, giving Operation Canyon a clear picture of him. Police at last had a visual ID on the burglar and his suspected driver, but still no names for the offenders. All we had was CCTV of two males getting out of a van, a white Citroen Berlingo. We could use our AMPR technology to get a, uh, a registration for that vehicle. Automatic number plate recognition identified the van and owner. Which showed us who the vehicle was registered to, which was suspect number one. The CCTV didn't show them committing any of the offences. And yes, they were in the local area, but that wasn't enough. So really we need to build a full evidential picture so that when they are arrested, they go straight to prison. While one half of Operation Canyon gathered evidence against the suspects, PC Eels was sent out to keep an eye on their target and build a picture of their day-to-day -day movements. As the disruption team, we deployed into the areas where we thought the suspects would be in order to try and uh, get more intelligence around that vehicle, if we could find it on the move, see who was in it without showing our hand. Uh, and making them aware of the, the police interest in them. Exactly three weeks after the first burglary, the suspect struck again. The victim was an 81-year-old female. An elderly female was at home in Faversham. She was expecting somebody to come and fit some fire alarms. A white van pulled up outside the property and a male walked up and said that he was there to fit the fire alarms. The female let him into the property and began making a cup of tea. The male then said he needed to go and get something from the car and never returned. And it was then that they realised the quantity of jewellery had been stolen. Knowing that she probably won't ever get those items back, the thought of that for the victim was extremely upsetting. There was no CCTV in the area. Witness sent us a picture of the vehicle that she Googled on the internet and felt that it was similar and that matched exactly what we had already got from the shop. But the criminals weren't finished yet. Five days later, they attacked again. This time with the burglar pretending to be a council employee. We received a report from an elderly female. This particular victim is severely disabled. She is unable to walk or get out of a chair and she lives by herself. A male had walked through her patio doors and claimed to be from the council, started looking around her property and helping himself to valuable items within. We identified a camera opposite the victim's address. From the previous knowledge, we knew that this was the same person. It's frustrating when we're finding more offences that are occurring, but the more times he commits offences, the more evidence we can build. We had to arrest him as soon as possible. Ideally, we wanted to catch him in this vehicle as this is what linked him to so many of the crimes. Two days later, Operation Canyon were ready to strike back. PC Eels took a team out with the aim to arrest the burglar and his partner in crime. I stayed behind and prepared what we needed for the investigation. It was really a, a one-shot thing. If we'd have gone to the address and they weren't there, we've shown our hand. It was important for us that 
one or both of the suspects were in this subject van. On that day, I was feeling a bit nervous if anything went wrong, but more excited to know that this guy was finally going to get what was coming to him. We conducted a recce of the home address and the van wasn't on the driveway. So we spread out around the likely route and after a few hours, there was no sightings of the vehicle. He decided to revisit the target house and get as close as possible. I deployed on foot without any uh, obvious police equipment. To his shock, both offenders had returned home without being seen. By a little bit of luck, I spotted the suspect getting into the van. This is the time where we need to strike. It's time to go. Before police could do anything, the two targets in their van were off. Both suspects were now in the vehicle. He took a, a rural route into Waterham Bay. We believe he was aware of the police vehicles following him. And he made a sudden move and parked on the pavement on the wrong side of the road to make a quick exit from the vehicle. We boxed him in using our three cars. Go out the side, go out the side, so. Go, let's go. One of the suspects has tried to uh, walk quickly away from the vehicle. He was arrested very swiftly. I was able to get to the van and arrest the second suspect. No, no. At the moment, you're under arrest on suspicion of conspiracies to burgle, OK? Ooh. Been identified as part of uh, a group of people carrying out burglaries. It's part of an investigation. I think I jumped up in the air. I was so, so happy. Do not mention when questioned something so like that, and then you do say maybe giving an evidence. It took a bit of time, a lot of planning, but it worked well. It was a team effort. We had to work quickly to stop him from committing any further burglaries. All right, before you got in there, it's been searched. I'm not wearing a seatbelt. You are wearing a seatbelt. I'm, 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 I'm medical get... exempt. Talk from wearing a seatbelt. Because I've broke my back. Okay. I'm medical exempt. Check it now. Where's your exemption? At home. Right. At home. The main suspect was very difficult to deal with in custody. He refused to come out of the cell to have an interview. When we went into the cell, he became violent. He was extremely aggressive towards us, shouting and screaming. He threw a cup of water in my colleague's face and just refused to answer any questions. While the burglar fought in police custody, Operation Canyon were trawling through the mobile phones of both offenders. A very important line of inquiry was mobile phone data. We knew that all we had was a van and him. That is going to go into some sort of special property. It is indeed, and that was in his pocket, was it? Uh, his, his phone was in, his, in the passenger's hand, in his hand. We wanted to make sure that we hadn't missed any offences, so examining the phone data showed him in the exact fence locations at certain points um, and also in the surrounding area at various other times. And when combined with the other suspect's phone being in the same location with the CCTV and the descriptions, just put the nail in the coffin, really. He was charged with six counts of burglary. Both offenders were guilty. The burglar, Paul Ellis, was sentenced to over six years in prison, reflecting the fact he had targeted the victims of the burglaries. His accomplice was sentenced to 12 months. The victims were overjoyed. It was really nice to actually be able to tell them to know that they could sleep at night and not be worried about this man returning. According to the UN, counterfeiting is now the second largest source of criminal income worldwide. UK government stats show that annual loss to the economy through counterfeiting and piracy is over £9 billion. Counterfeiting is also believed to cause 80,500 job losses in the UK each year. I've worked in policing for around 18 years now. I've worked in lots of roles ranging from serious fraud, murder investigation teams uh, and violent crime. 
Kevin Ives is the lead detective of the Intellectual Property Crime Unit within City of London Police. The unit has suspended more than 30,000 websites and dealt with over £100 million worth of counterfeit goods. Counterfeit goods are any goods which are sold bearing a false trademark or a false name. The criminals will counterfeit absolutely anything. This one, a uh, baby carrier, I mean, what a thing to counterfeit. It doesn't need me to explain what would happen if a, a baby carrier failed because it wasn't manufactured properly or had a fault. These crime types are clustered around the country. In this case particularly, it was in the northwest of England. In December 2018, the unit had intel on an organised crime group supplying counterfeit footwear and operating at a truly exceptional scale. They were so prolific that their goods were showing up in other seizures around the country. So they came to notice really because of the volume of their counterfeit output. To tackle this unique crime, DI Kevin Ives pulled together a specialist team, including Detective Constable Daryl Fryatt. On a case like this, we'll have a, a lead investigator in this case, Daryl, whose job it is to get the detail right, to, to drive that case forward. My background is covert policing. As investigators, we can look at proactive tactics. I like it because it's the, it's the more fun and rewarding elements of policing. The team was given the name Operation Blenheim. Operation Blenheim was one of our biggest counterfeit goods jobs. This was uh, an organised crime group supplying counterfeit footwear Trading standards in Manchester had seized fake shoes being sold under the company name Apple Footwear as early as 2017. They seized items from various markets all over the country. A sizable amount, I mean hundreds of thousands worth of Apple Footwear. They've looked at the design of the Air Max and they've put every uh, label you'd expect it to be. There's not one missed, so they've got it on the sides. They've got the, the, you know, the swoosh where you'd expect it to be, they've done the hill. They're good quality fakes. And every time a seizure happened, this Apple footwear would crop up. And the questions were asked, well, where's this coming from? By 2018, Operation Blenheim had settled on the owners of Apple footwear being their principal targets. Their base was in North Manchester. We've got two people who's involved in it. There's a husband and wife team. And they're both directors of Apple footwear. So then we sat around the table and looked at what options we had. Uh, and one that we picked was to monitor the imports coming in uh, into the country for Apple footwear and see what, what they were importing. The team hoped to find branded fakes as part of Apple footwear's imported inventories. But their Border Force colleagues discovered instead only footwear with no visible branding. Bad guys know that if they, for example, want to get 10,000 pairs of fake trainers in, they will import blank trainers and then carry in some of the trademarks and, and logos to be stitched on whilst they're in the UK. Finding the logos would help build the case. So Border Force monitored Apple Footwear's imports for three more months. From what we knew from train standards, they're doing quite a lot of business. They should be importing quite a bit of stock. But very suddenly, things changed. Nothing came in, no labels came in. Um, which was disappointing and surprising. From what we knew from trained standards, they're doing quite a lot of business, which means they, they should be importing quite a bit of stock. The business was still running, we checked that, everything was still running as you'd expect. We later found that on the day we started monitoring the importations, they changed their company name from Apple Footwear and Apple Apparel to TYSD Limited. That was changed on the day we started monitoring the importations, which was was a shame, surprising, you know, maybe it was bad luck. It was just a very bad timing. <laughs> Obviously the main reason why we didn't find any labels or footwear coming to the country. So this is one of the big decisions we had to make is, what do we do now? The decision was made for Operation Blenheim to turn their focus from the docks to a warehouse the suspects rented in Manchester. Then we changed tactic to looking at them. We used covert methods. And that's where we established that this warehouse was somewhere that they both spent quite a lot of time. Massive warehouse. 
the amount of time they spend there led us to believe that that's where most of their stock is kept, and that is potentially where all the labels and the counterfeits are kept. Despite weeks of further surveillance, very little stock seemed to be coming in. We'd had the monitoring on for a couple of months now, and nothing had, had, had come through. And it's one of those decisions where you make your own luck, you make a decision which could go either way. The team still didn't have enough evidence to secure a conviction. Operation Blenheim faced a dilemma. That's when we started looking at enforcement action. The decision was to draw up warrants for the warehouse, home addresses, and for the footwear store in Cheatham Hill. From the train stand as evidence, we had enough to put before a, a judge to say, look, we believe they're selling counterfeit goods. The raid might deliver the crucial evidence required, but if it failed, the criminals could go to ground. It was a make or break moment for the case. Police targets were the shop, the suspect's home, and the warehouse. I took a team to the shop. Oh. What's good? And we're here for we've got yeah. warrant search premises. At the shop, we found our first piece of luck. We found a Luton van, which was parked up against the shop. That was full of labels. You okay? Yes. Yeah. You'll be shaky. You can sit down if you want to sit down. The husband, Jia Gang Jia, was arrested, and thousands of branded labels ready to be sewn onto counterfeit shoes were seized. At the home address, £15,000 sterling was found and $4,000. I did feel pressure on. It was a relief when you realised that, you know, the evidence you got there is, is, is good. The bulk of the officers went to the warehouse. That's a big unit. Body cam on. At the warehouse, officers were immediately confronted by hundreds of boxes of shoes. Whoa. There was a huge amount of counterfeit goods. We recovered more goods than we were expecting to, to the point where we had to put something in place to literally seize the warehouse and lock it down because we couldn't transport that amount of goods. Two hundred seventy-seven thousand pairs of uh, footwear were seized. That came to a retail loss of one point three million. If you're paying the recommended retail price, the police had all the evidence they needed, but they didn't have the wife Help until me. they tracked her down to a local yeah, gym. What language do you speak? Mandarin or Cantonese? It's Mandarin. Mandarin. Okay. When we get to the police station, we'll have uh, an interpreter there. Excuse me. Do you have a pin or passcode for your phone? The main evidence did come from the phone. A lot of images of counterfeit goods, a lot of evidence of selling counterfeit goods. Various videos of, of like a kind of self-teach on how to apply labels to each piece of footwear. We found evidence of a factory in China where the Apple footwear were being made and boxed up on a production line. The husband and wife were charged with infringing trademark and money laundering. I didn't think they actually received the gravity of the situation they was in. I think that only dawned on them when they were charged and, and we reminded them in custody. At court, the husband, Jia Gang Jia, was sentenced to two years in prison, while his wife received a suspended sentence. All of their assets were seized and their criminal operation had been broken. The thousands of fake trainers the fraudsters were selling were sent to a secret location It was a great result, and I think it showed the industry what, what we can all do if we work together. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but if everyone does their job and provides information, we can all work together and actually get a good result. I was really, really pleased with the result. I think that this was potentially one of the biggest suppliers of counterfeit footwear in the UK. And as a team, we'd taken down that business, we'd taken down that criminal enterprise, taken it apart, stripped the assets, and locked up the bad guys. <laughs>